All right, so what do we do when we have a problem like 19 pi over 2 and we need to be able to evaluate the six trigonometric functions or maybe just evaluate any of the trigonometric functions? Like, how do we do that? And I think the first thing we need to understand is what is the coordinate point that lies in the inner circle for the angle 19 pi over 6? So one thing, we need to understand what is 19 pi over 6 in terms of radians as well as in terms of like a number as well as how do we graph that in standard form and what point does that correlate on? So there's a lot that we need to know. I think the first thing we need to do is break up the 19 um, pi or 19 over 2. Forget about the pi for a second. Let's just forget about radians. Let's just take a 19 over 2. All right, now that is an improper fraction. And maybe you remember in like the good old days, like when we did fractions, like, oh yes, just even fraction. No letters, no radians, decimals, just fractions. And one thing we talked about was it, we liked to convert improper fractions into what we call mixed numbers, right? And the way to do that was we took our denominator and said, all right, how many times does that evenly divide into our numerator? And you could say in this case, that is going to divide into there nine times, right? And then we took the remainder, which would be not, two times nine is going to be 18, so it has a remainder of one. And then we put that in the numerator and then we keep the denominators two. So therefore, I could rewrite this as a nine and one half, right? And let's go and see, like that makes sense. Hopefully and you can see like two goes into 19 nine times with the remainder of one. Okay, so this is our mixed number. That is our improper fraction. So how does this represent? Because we don't really talk about radians in terms of mixed numbers, right? That's kind of weird. So one thing you need to understand about when we're dealing with radians is like, we remember halfway around a circle represents pi. All the way around a circle represents two pi, okay? Now we usually don't write a one in front of this, but that's something I want you to understand. Like halfway around is like one, all the way around would be two, right? Now you can keep on going this extra revolutions in this case. So what I want you to kind of see here is we have this one half. I want to be able to rewrite this number in something that's probably maybe a little bit more familiar to what I have. And to do that, what we need to understand is like what happens when we have these extra revolutions, right? The thing that's important about when we're dealing with angles that are larger than pi, you need to understand like if I go around the circle once, like I'm back to where I started, right? That's what we call like a revolution of pi. So as long as you're going around an even number, okay, you're just back to where you started. However, if you go around an odd number, right, if I just say like, you know, an extra one rev, like, or not one, right, you can see I'm over here, I'm on the negative version of this x-axis. That's gonna be something different. So what I want you to do is say like, all right, well, how many revolutions is this, right? So again, forget about the pi for a second, just kind of think of like whatever the number is in front, that'd be a revolution. So therefore I could rewrite this as a two, that'd be one revolution, plus two, that'd be another revolution, right? So let's go around four, plus two, be another revolution, Right, so now we're on three revolutions. But again, like, doesn't matter even if I counted it wrong, like three or two, like, it doesn't matter. We're back to where we started, right? Two, four, six, I can go around another, right? So six, two, four, six, eight, right? And then I gotta add a one plus a one half, which is kind of weird, all right? But what I want you to understand is one, two, three, all these revolutions, right? So you could say two pi plus two pi plus two pi plus two pi plus a pi plus a pi. Right, that's technically what we were doing here with these revolutions. Well, that's just taking us back to the beginning. That's taking us back to the beginning, back to the beginning, back to the beginning, back. And then here, you could say, oh, well, it's like a one and then a one half. And again, like that should hopefully make sense. One plus one half is equal to three halves. And hopefully you recognize that three pi over two, right, is represented by this coordinate point, which hopefully would make sense, right? We did a revolution all the way around, which is two pi another revolution two pi, another revolution two pi, another revolution two pi, then we went over one pi and then in half, right? And you could see like, yeah, that's a half of a pi. So hopefully you can see how that makes sense. Now we just need to understand, well, what exactly is that coordinate point? This coordinate point is going to be a zero comma negative one. So how do we now evaluate our six trigonometric functions from there? Well, remember, when we're dealing with sine, cosine, and tangent, uh, we want to evaluate them on the unit circle. We're looking for the x and the y coordinate of that point that lies on the unit circle for our angle, right? Because our angle is going to end here. So you can see x is going to be 0 and y is going to be negative 1 half. So the sine of our angle, 19 pi over 2, is going to represent the y coordinate. The cosine of 19 pi over 2 is going to represent x coordinate. And the tangent is going to represent the y over the x. So let's go ahead and write all of those out. Okay, so remember sine represents y, so in this case that's negative 1. Cosine of 19 pi over 2 represents the x, which in this case is going to be a 0. And the tangent represents the y over the x. Notice that's going to be a negative 1 over 0, so therefore that's going to be an undefined. Now let's go ahead and do our reciprocal functions. All 
Okay, so remember that's just going to be one over y for the cosecant. So we have y is negative one. So one over y is going to be a one over negative one, which is just a negative one. If we go to secant, that's going to be one over x, right? Well, x is zero, so one over zero is going to be a undefined. And then when we go ahead and take a look at cotangent, that is going to be, now a lot of times students are like, well, how do you do one over un <laughs> undefined? Like that has to be undefined as well. Yes, again, if you are thinking of this answer, but in this case, let's go back to it. If tangent is y over x, then cotangent is going to be x over y. So in this case, you have a zero over a negative one, which is just gonna equal a negative one. Now this problem was difficult because we had a really, really big angle. But in the next video, I'll go through the exact same process for an angle that's so big, we can't even graph it.